Hey, what's going on, jabronis? All right. Good day uh, in the studio today. I mean, we haven't started, but it's going to be a good motherfucking day. I can already taste it. So the looking at today's workload, um, pretty straightforward. Uh, the composition is very similar to the previous one and the previous one before that and the previous one before that and the previous one before that because obviously it's a series, so there's going to be very minor variations in between each. So today's workload, just like yesterday's and the day before that, is pretty straightforward. We are starting with the figure, working from dark to light, probably mixing up the local colors that we're working on at the moment, uh, and then moving on to the background. Regarding the background, I feel like maybe the cat might be a bit out of proportion, maybe a little bit too large for the scenario. So just depending, I might go in and adjust that on the fly or paint it in and then come back and make a correction if it is, in fact, still feeling too large. When I composed it on the computer, it kind of looked good, but now looking at it up on the canvas, it's, you know, there's some discrepancies. So we'll see. We'll see about that. Uh, what else? <laughs> the other thing I'm thinking about is... Um, whether I should keep all of these like strictly shadow cats because there's some of the reference photos that I have where you can in fact see the ball and I'm wondering how fun it might be to actually have uh, the, the animal in there. It's kind of always like the setup, it's not really like after but there are some where like there's, you know, th like there's one specific image that I have in mind and the tennis player had hit the ball already and so the ball itself had a bit of like a, a motion blur to it. And so I was wondering if it would be a good idea possibly to include kind of like the blurry cat inside of the thing. And, um, you know, just give, yeah, give it like a, a like a directional uh, mo a motion blur as opposed to like a Gaussian kind of radial blur where it goes outward. This kind of blur is more like a trajectory so the cat is being launched through the air and that's how that's working i'm wondering if that might be a viable option for this series i'm going to for sure probably try one out at this uh, smaller scale and then if i end up liking it i might blow it up the other thing too is i think uh i'm going to take some of these and make them large scale because i'm trying to explore something a little bit different with large scale paintings especially for this show and maybe even just moving forward a little bit more permanently um, projecting instead of the reference photo, uh, I'd like to try and project the finished painting of the, you know, the smaller version so that I can translate the brushwork to a large scale. Because what I notice is that my lar my smaller paintings seem to have a very beautiful, loose, kind of like juicy, efficient kind of brushwork where you know, two or three strokes communicates an entire, you know, uh, area. And I find that it's a little bit more difficult to do that with larger scale paintings, precisely because the way that the, the brush itself just doesn't scale up, you know, I'm using like the same size brush on a small one, so it's going to cover more area. And then when I translate it to a, a larger painting, it's going to cover less area. So it's going to look more fussy, it's going to look more detailed. And I'm wondering, you know, I've got some really big flat brushes that are great. So I'm wondering if I just project it up, if maybe that'll help my mind kind of just start seeing those things a little bit more efficiently or economically in that way. And uh, maybe that'll be a good practice in, in translating this very fresh brushwork. It's something that I, I think I probably thought about doing for a long time, but haven't really committed to it. So I think I'll do that uh, within this body of work. And uh, yeah, that's it. So that might happen later. And I'll, you know, end up, I'll take you guys through like image selection if I do. But otherwise, let's get to work. We've got plenty of it. All right, I just finished getting my palette set up, the old palette. I'll list the colors that I've got here on the bottom. And I'm, you know, just as I said, mixing my local flesh tones right now i'm specifically mixing for the legs and then i'm gonna start mixing for the arms and then after that the face i do want to note that so much if not all of my color um, mixing and matching method is based on mark carter's method he is like the absolute goat of 
uh, color mixing and color matching and I would strongly recommend that you check out his work. I'm, I'm not super sure how to link it here physically, but you know, I put like a picture of his head up there and like his uh, stuff so you can check it out. Right now I am applying, uh, well, I got just got done with the legs. So now I'm working on the arms again, working shadows first from dark to light. And um, I'm working kind of back and forth between the two since I can, you know, I don't want to work one arm and then the other one if I can kind of get be more efficient and kind of get the colors down as I've got them on the brush you know it just saves a little trip you might have also noticed that I did the big brain move and I repositioned my laptop so that I, it's not behind me anymore yeah freaking big genius move over here man big brain guy so now I don't have to crane my neck as much it does produce these kind of wild head movements in the time lapse but um, at least I'm getting things done a little bit quicker and that's so much of like what um, I think is just about efficiency man at, at this point everything is just making like the slightest little tweaks uh, to just kind of give myself an edge you know um, whether it's like moving the table itself closer to the painting or moving the reference photo you know I think even there could be a way for me to have the palette even closer um, you know, because I still have to kind of turn around, but I do sort of like to spread out in a big area. So there's things to figure out there for sure, you know. And you can also see on the reference on the computer itself how I go about using Photoshop's um, color selector to go in and manually isolate little colors and then mix them from there. And then I usually use as a neutral uh, to for comparison, either maybe like a black or white. Um, based on you know photoshop's color selection and so i'll use that as just kind of like a neutral and i can weigh that you know if i'm using white i can compare that to the white of the palette and that'll kind of give me a general uh, gauge for how close i'm getting to what i want to do and then obviously watching things come together on the canvas itself is a great way to gauge and then make adjustments but for the most part man i i find that i mix it pretty damn accurately the first time around and that is just you know after years and years of practice, uh, I remember when I lived in my first apartment, um, I used to just for fun sit around and, you know, just mi manually mix uh, the colors from different objects that I had lying around the house. So if it was like, you know, a shampoo bottle, I would mix the red of the cap or if it was like a banana, I would mix the peel, you know, just little things like that. And that helped me so much along the way. So yeah, again, I would strongly suggest checking out Mark Carter uh, and everything that he does, you know, regarding color mixing, color matching, and just painting in general. He's just got a really good handle on things and breaks it down in a very simple way. Again, for the shadows on this one, um, there wasn't kind of, it was again, a very hard shadow. So where I usually tell you guys like not to butt colors up against each other too much, there was a little bit more of that in the shadow section on this painting. And so I got the figure done, and then now I'm going in and just kind of outlining everything, all of the objects, because I'm going to be filling it in with a bigger brush, and this just makes it so that I don't have to get too close to my important areas, and then potentially, like, you know, mess them up with, a, you know, the bad stroke of the brush. So here, just going in with a smaller brush and getting all the little nooks and crannies in there, making sure that, you know, I kind of sharpen him up where it needs to be sharpened and then towards the back if it needs a little bit of uh, modulation around the edges i'll go ahead and do that at that time as well and same old man picking a pattern and just sticking to it mostly for the sake of the photograph which again is not something that you know you're obligated or i would even really encourage to do it's just something that i consider and also just part of my own you know ocd that makes me want to uh, you know paint in that manner for the last part on the stripes on this um i actually just kind of go very thick with paint and it's probably the thickest area of application to paint for some reason the white stripes on this i just kind of wanted them to feel very like tactile for some reason and i love uh you know i love the the, the kind of general air that it gives the painting you'll see right now in the photos but it just um it just really kind of gives it a good a good look i don't know what it is about it but Let's cue that B-roll.
So yeah, dudes, uh, the day, kind of midway through the painting, I started getting a pretty gnarly headache. Uh, so I'm home now and um, just kind of getting this video done and the headache is now kind of sort of going away. I took some meds a while ago. I've been drinking a lot of water. Um, I want to remind you guys to freaking stay hydrated, dude. Um, I'm like Patrick CC over here, man. Stay hydrated. So that's today's takeaway. Today's takeaway is all about hydration, dude. Drink water um, and uh, don't get headaches, man, when you don't need to. Okay? All right. I love you guys and I'll see you tomorrow. Uh.